when they group all STEM together, women are making great strides in closing that gap. However, when you take out computer science and just look at that, women are still far underrepresented. And that's a problem because AI, I mean, it is right there. It's mathematics, it's computer science. And in that follow on to your comment of we got to get it right now, we need those diverse voices right now. Welcome to the Conversations on Applied AI podcast where Justin Grammons and the team at Emerging Technologies North talk with experts in the fields of artificial intelligence and deep learning. In each episode, we cut through the hype and dive into how these technologies are being applied to real-world problems today. We hope that you find this episode educational and applicable to your industry and connect with us to learn more about our organization at AppliedAI.mn. Enjoy! Welcome everyone to the Conversations on Applied AI podcast. Today I'm thrilled to have Lois and Ross Melbourne as guests on the show. Lois is an author presenting visions of What If. Her former life was exciting as a software CEO and entrepreneur, and she is now the Chief Story Officer at My Future Story. Chief Story Officer, I really like that, Lois. That's an awesome title. Within her nonprofit work for My Future Story, she published The STEM Club Goes Exploring and Kids Go to Work Day. She loves to coach kids and schools through the wonderment of career exploration with the mission to inspire kids toward purposefully designing their futures. And being an educator myself, I love the mission and something that I know we'll dive uh, into more during this conversation. Her third book and the first novel is the sci-fi Moral Code. It was written in collaboration with her business partner and husband, Ross, who is also on the show as well. Ross, you are a uh, lifelong innovator, entrepreneur, and patent holder. You've lived and worked in the U.S. for 30 years, but grew up in England making stuff for fun. Ross developed the world's first automatic organization charting software and then co-founded Acquire with his wife, Lois. Ross is a proven business executive and technology leader using what he calls family first ethics. So I'm curious to know more about that. And uh, is an angel investor and mentor with multiple startups. So a uh, huge thank you, Lois and Ross, for being on the show today. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thank you. Well, hopefully my uh, intro here did a little bit of justice. And, you know, there's a lot of things for us to talk about in this episode. And I know we're going to cover moral code in the time that we have today. But I also want to make sure, of course, that we touch on this trait that I kind of see in both of you, which is this trait of sort of giving back, you know, and interesting. And your interest in, in STEM, and I just have a lot of like a huge, huge amount of respect, I guess, as I've started to kind of do a little bit of research on you before this, um, and helping kids and, and startup. So thank you for all of that, for sure. I gave a, gave a quick highlight on both of you, but maybe Lois, you could um, maybe start and maybe share your background and maybe work up to the time when you and Ross met. Life began when we met. <laughs> okay. Um, we were pretty young when we first got together. We actually met at a Super Bowl party and, and got married five years later on Super Bowl Sunday. So, so there's a, a little Melbourne trivia for you. Okay. <laughs> um, my background for school was in, was in marketing and I was very interested in the creative side, but my very first job was with computers in the 80s and I didn't think that was abnormal, but uh -huh. I guess it kind of was. It was more the word processing side, but got into right after graduation, started at a systems integrator, did some network engineering and but mostly training and software selection. And Ross came to me with his product idea and some proof of concept there. And I'm like, ooh, if you can build that, I can sell it. We did that. Um, nice. I was on the, the CEO side building relationships with the ERP systems and sales. And Ross was our, he's a tech visionary. And we sold that to a private equity firm. And so now we're kind of on to our next thing with I'm writing and like you said, helping kids explore careers. And I have a passion for getting people to the polls and voting. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Cool. Well, very, very good. Very good. Yeah. And I'm sure we definitely will cover all those topics here as we're sort of talking through. And, you know, Ross, I think about computers in the 80s. I mean, I, you know, kind of showing my age, I grew up, you know, dabbling around with Apple II, you know, writing basic and stuff like that, probably in the late 70s. You know, what was the computer industry like back then? Maybe, you know, you could tell us a little bit about your, your background and sort of how you got into technology. Yeah, I grew up in the UK. So born and raised in, the, in England. I feel very lucky, actually, to have been kind of born and kind of reached 
like my teenage, late teenage years, just the time that microcomputers became somewhat popular in, in, in England and the US. So my first computer was a Sinclair Spectrum and I taught myself how to program in basic. And then I, I, I taught myself how to code in machine language and an assembler. You know, at that point, I had the confidence to kind of switch, switch careers and become a COBOL programmer. Being able to be a COBOL programmer back in the late 80s meant you could go anywhere in the world. And so I have a brother who lives here in Texas, and he actually told me about Lois before I immigrated to the States. And so, you know, he thought we, we would be a good match for each other. He was absolutely right. So we met at that Super Bowl party, and we never looked back. It's been a you know, fantastic marriage and partnership. And Lois is just one of those uh, people that learns very quickly and is interested in all kinds of things. And all the kind of crazy things technology was I was interested in, she would listen. And I was always impressed at how quickly she figured out how to apply these technologies to business. That's amazing. That's really, really special. Thanks for sharing that sort of story. A Super Bowl party, I mean, was, was I guess living in Texas, you kind of have to like football, I guess. We didn't pay <laughs> much attention to the football. <laughs> I gotcha. Gotcha. Well, so sort of shifting gears, right? Going, going from a technology startup Lois or, you know, a, a organization that's building technology and then, you know, selling it now all of a sudden becoming an author, you know, maybe let's, let's talk a little bit about Moral Code. I know this was your third book, but maybe you can share with us maybe the plot and story of Moral Code and, and where the idea came from. So Moral Code is a wonderful story about if I could build an AI, Ellie would be the one that I would want. The premise is being able to contain AI within a ethical framework. And if you could do that, then what would be the most ethical charge you could give to an AI? And it would be to protect kids and to help them, help educate them, but to protect them from some of the, the brutalities that are there in the world. So we have a protagonist that designed a moral operating system to have in the hopes that all AIs would be built upon that. Her assistant, Ellie, grows a great deal during the process of the story, and they, they move to protect kids, and it's predominantly because they get exposed to how much abuse and trafficking there is for kids, and, and Ellie and Kira are set out to kind of change that. Gotcha. And there, there's some sort of a, a specific event that happens, right, in this uh, that sort of sets off this chain reaction at the beginning of the book? Yeah, at the beginning, there's an earthquake. Ellie is with Kira, but she can't do much because they're, they're trapped in an earthquake building. But a group of Americans come with a surveillance, very secretive surveillance nanite that can penetrate down into the crevices of the building and help with communication and finding the location of those people that are trapped. That starts a relationship between Kira, who's the engineer working with AI, and Roy, who is the billionaire that owns the company with the nanite. And they merge together and start off on this journey trying to figure out whether they trust each other. Gotcha. And I think I had read somewhere, you know, you, this was kind of just an idea that both of you sort of hatched together over like breakfast one day. Is that, is that true? Ross was actually the one that started the idea. He should probably tell you how he um, came up with the original idea. Well, I remember we were sitting having breakfast and um, Lois had written two children's books and, but she wanted to write a novel and, and, and she asked me, well, you know, what novel would you write if you could write a novel? And I'd always kept coming back to the same concept we had talked about many times, and that is imagining technology that became so advanced that and so miniaturized that it, it literally was everywhere. It was omnipresent. What if it could protect children? We had long talked about, you know, how to fix the world. If you could prevent childhood trauma, those children would not grow up to, you know, potentially break crime, make crimes and, and be bad people. I always joke that, you know, I did, did well picking my parents, but, you know, kids don't have that choice. And so, yeah, I think it, it stemmed from that kind of conversation about how could we, you know, highlight, you know, protecting children and uh, have a, a utopian future instead of dystopian future. And, and that's really how the conversation started. And 
She said, well, you know, would I help her with this and on the science and technology side of it? And I said, sure. And we, you know, obviously we'd collaborated on, on software before. This was not as much a software project as it was a technology kind of futuristic ideas project. And, uh, and, and Lois just ran with the ball and we just kind of worked together on the storyline. Lois started writing chapters and I was just blown away by just how good the initial chapters were. The story was great. It's very engaging. You know, in this period of writing this book, she has become a full-blown novelist. And that's a tremendously uh, impressive kind of feat from being a business communicator and business leader to now being a novelist. It's very impressive. Yeah, no, I, I, it's sort of an item that's on my bucket list, I guess, someday to be able to write a book. Although my books would probably be pretty dry. They would just be all about some sort of new technology. And I guess maybe, Ross, were you, were you sort of bringing in like, what's te- technically feasible, I guess, in, in some of these things. Yep. And then Lois was making it into a story that would read well. Yeah, I think that's basically what my role was, was, was coming up with technology. And I, I enjoyed uh, books like The Martian, where it was hard science fiction, meaning that there was, it was feasible for it to be created at some point in time. You know, having a background in software and, and worked in machine learning myself, I kind of had an idea of the of the limitations of machine learning, but where it you know where it could grow to, and also the, the major challenges of AI, which was you know it, it doesn't really have any kind of soul, you know, and if you let it, it'll make very bad decisions. And then people are always worried and scared about AI taking over the world, and so addressing how would you create an, an artificial intelligence system that had moral underpinnings and had an ethical framework that Lois mentioned. Now, that was the, the challenge on the software side. On the hardware side, which was not my, my forte, I had to do a lot of research on, you know, how far could you take miniaturization? How would you power very, very small machines? How would they move to the air? How would they communicate? You know, what physically could they do? And so we wrote a lot of notes and, and Lois and I would meet and, and I'd share those notes with her. And she had the difficult task of, weaving that into the story and building the characters out to make it believable. And I think she's done a fantastic job in, in doing both those things. For sure. So Ellie in the story is a, is, is a virtual assistant, right? It's, a, it's an AI, it's a bot? Yes. Can it reach out and touch the physical world? I mean, I always wonder, so how, how do you protect a child when you don't really have any physical mechanisms to do that? Kira and Ellie both start when Ellie is still just, a, still just an assistant and audible. But the eventually, Ellie and Nanite have an exploratory mission together. And so there does become a little bit more of a physicality to the whole process. It was interesting as the story was evolving, learning about all of the different ways that you have to train an AI and what are all of the problems if you have bias in your data. And part of my objective was to make AIs consumable for the non-techie person and also even for the non-science fiction reader. But yet, like Ross said, we wanted it to be very realistic tech. That was a, a challenge to show the evolution as you feed more data in. And if you feed bias data what happens and what decisions get made, but trying to make that in an illustrative educational mode without it sounding educational. That was both difficult and a lot of fun to be able to kind of build that into to see the AI develop over time because more data and more training became available. There was times when I present something out to Ross and he'd read it and go, that's not going to happen. <laughs> so you had to bring in this, uh, yeah, some reality. It's it's not pure 100% science fiction. Right. Is that true to say? I think the thing that I was trying to do was, I think with science fiction, you go big or go home. You know, you start off with kind of humble beginnings in the story, but really the, the story behind moral code, and I can't give away the, the plot line or the ending, but, um, you know, it has a dramatic impact on humanity. From that point forwards, from from the end of the book forwards, it has a dramatic impact on humanity. And also, you mentioned physicality. You know, what I was trying to design was the ultimate robotic system. 
a robotic system to end all robotic systems. And that's the story in the book as well. So for me, it was a lot of fun because I got to, you know, to fantasize about where technology would go. But ultimately, you know, Lois drove the story to a utopian future where, you know, it came, came very close to not being that in the story. And I think that that's, that's exciting. So that hopefully there'll be, um, you know, follow on books and uh, perhaps even movies from made from this story. So yeah, that's where we left it. <laughs> so there might be a follow up to it, you know, potentially in the future. The other thing that I've seen is, is maybe you're, you're trying to get discussion around this book, right? You talk about, may, uh, Lois, I think you said, this is a great book for those that want to debate ethics and technology. Um, yes. And so, you know, have you engaged book clubs with this? Have you had some open conversations around ethics? How has that been received, I guess? Yeah, we're starting those conversations. You know, the, the book's launched fairly recently, but it is definitely part of the conversation is, you know, people, they're afraid of AI. They're afraid of robotics. Media has a, a very big role to play in that. Entertainment yeah. has, you know, they set up drama and, well, where is their drama? It's building fear. That is something that is definitely in a lot of the conversations I have around the book. Also, the difficulty of defining what is ethical. In writing a book, there's big chapters and, and anyone that's done software or hardware development knows what I'm talking about in this process for their field too. You have this feature list and that's the wish list. And then mm-hmm, you got to sure. take stuff out. That is reality. Yeah. And in writing it, sometimes there's whole chapters and they get yanked but there's threads that can stay in it. So goal of defining that ethical definition that people would accept to say, if you're going to trust that AIs are making ethical decisions, how do you define the ethics? In our world, we created an an entire organization around crowdsourcing the definitions and the training set of ethics. What is ethical? What is ethical decisions? How do you train ethics? And, you know, this would be globally crowdsourced and pulled together from the different elements of religions and corporations and educational institutions to define agreed upon nugget, if you will, very large nugget, for what truly is the definition for AI so that you can build those boundaries. So, you know, that was kind of a a world in and of itself that we kind of had to develop because we wanted to make it realistic that someone could define it and have somebody say, well, some lady up in Stanford can't just decide what is ethical. In the book, it was crowdsourced um, ethics, which I think is the key to it. That's great. I mean, and I think defining ethics is one thing. How would you either or both of you define artificial intelligence? How, 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 would, how do you define or try and boil it down to what is AI? Kind of a question I like to ask people who are on the program. Well, I'll, I'll go first on that one. You know, I see it as software that, you know, does a job that is trained instead of kind of coded, it's trained with data and a lot of data, you know, so it's making decisions and predictions based on its training data. Well, as not being the expert in the room on AI, I will kind of just acquiesce to, you know, to Ross's definition, other than to say that the importance in the definition of AI is that the training and the data that creates any of that artificial intelligence, that's the key, that it has to be good data considerate data for it to be a, a usable AI. Yeah. It was funny as you were talking about the ethics. So I, as a little bit of a, of a sidebar, I listen to Audible a lot when I go out on, on my runs and stuff. And there's this Audible free book that came out. I think it's called like the AI who loved me or something like that. It's an interesting little story. I haven't, haven't finished it all, but it was, it, it was interesting because like they talk about in this story, a scenario, which most people talk about the scenario where self-driving car you know, is it going to run into a human or is it going to run into something else? How does it make that decision? And in this book, it was, you know, it was programmed in such a way that it could, it could hit either a school bus full of kids or some sort of tractor trailer that was worth, you know, tens of millions of dollars or whatever. And the AI chose 
to hit the kids because of a pure dollar value amount, right? It was basically saying, well, no, I'm, I'm putting more, more money on this, uh, on these physical products that are worth millions of dollars than I am on kids' lives. And, you know, arguably, yeah, you're right. The person in Stanford should not be the person to make those sort of decisions on ethics. And so, you know, who, who does make those decisions, I guess, is kind of where a lot of these conversations are, are sort of going. It's, it's very, it's very timely because if we don't build these systems correct today, what's going to happen in the next three, five, 10 years going forward? Yes, and that concerns me. And one of the examples to help illustrate that in the story is after a FBI bust of a trafficking ring, a female, the AI, classifies a female that was in the room as a victim. And she was actually a trafficker. And so the discussion ensues that That's because the data that we have fed to you to recognize traffickers doesn't include that women could be in that role. Right. So trying to trying to simplify that for people to understand where biases come from without it being a preachy story, even though there's a lot to preach about bad data in the training, (laughs) but trying to make it different than what we're seeing already in in the news about AI. That was how I, I chose to kind of make that clear for the readers. We, we, we had fun with also, you know, the unexpected things that if you make an, an AI that's conversational, that is actually ethical, you might be surprised by some of the things they, they, ha- they object to. So in one you know, seen in, in the book, they ask Ellie, who's the, you know, AI character in the book, to if she will perform the Turing test, she'll take part in the Turing test. And she refuses because, you know, she does not want to try and mislead anyone. She, she finds that to be deceptive when, you know, the Turing test, as you know, is to, can you uh, make somebody believe that you're a real person? And, you know, that's her, her moral framework is not going to allow her to deliberately uh, deceive somebody. And I, I think that's a kind of interesting, fun type of less serious than what Lois mentioned, but fun, a fun thing that, you know, AIs, once they truly start making better decisions, um, could, could surprise us. And my interest in AI, I do actually apply it to business problems, but, you know, from a kind of a, just an intellectual standpoint, I'm interested, interested in the future of generalized artificial intelligence and what, where the breakthrough is going to come to become, you know, a truly generalized artificial intelligence that can can really reason. I think that that's that's where you know, we are in the book. You know, Ellie kind of breaks that that boundary and becomes a generalized artificial intelligence. Wow. Yeah, that's that's definitely an area where I don't think anyone anyone has the answer today, right? The, the where where is AGI going to eventually end up? And I've had people on the program like, what is what is consciousness? And and is the AI alive? And so we can talk about that for hours and. And then, you know, the other side where it's just, it's just numbers. So, I mean, everyone sort of has their own belief on it, but it's, it's going to be very, very interesting. And this is what excites me as well. And again, that's why, really why I sort of have this program is just to have us have discussions on it. Everyone has their own different, different topics or their own different perception. And I don't think anyone's right. And I, I think to go back to you, Lois, you know, you were like, well, I'm not the expert in the room. Well, I think everyone's an expert, honestly, in this field. This field is so new that just because you don't maybe understand all of the mathematical you know, simulations going on under the covers, it's really the applications of it. So I welcome everyone's input for sure in this. So it's, it's great. And I, I guess the other thing that I was kind of curious about, and I touched on a little bit at the beginning is it seems like, you know, Lois, you're really interested in, in STEM. You're really interested in, in helping women get into this field. And you know, maybe you could talk a little bit more about, you know, sort of what, what you're doing in that space. You had sort of two prior books and you're part of this nonprofit. You know, may, maybe I'd just be curious to have our listeners learn a little bit more about, about what you're doing there. Well, the nonprofit and my kids' books are driven around helping kids explore careers. So we so often see that kids, they don't plan for their future or, you know, they resent that question of what are you going to be when you grow up or, you know, however it gets phrased. But if you can find things that excite individuals at any age, you then have a much greater ability to help them find where they may want to take their their careers. And so I spend time predominantly with students, helping them find different ways to find what it is that interests them. And then how do they match that up to 
careers and fields that they think that they want to work in and then helping them kind of figure out ways to, to learn what those are. So it's a lot less about a job title and more about an industry or a type of job or a, a method that they can use to, to go further down that path. Beyond just students, I definitely have a personal vested interest in helping women feel comfortable in STEM, be accepted in STEM, and pursue those careers. And it's not just women, it's any person that, that frankly isn't a white male, to also feel welcome at the table, that we get a, a diversity, because you can also get a problem where you don't want just an an all-female team designing tech or any homogenous type of group because you need a diversity of voice. And so I am really enjoying the, the different ways of helping people understand that that is important, that having multiple voices at the table is extremely important. And I think that entertainment the media have a really big role to play in that because if you can see women in different roles, you know, Star Trek was a beautiful example of having a, you know, a very diverse group of individuals on the leadership team. You then accept more or that, yeah, well, women can do that. And even if it becomes subconsciously, you can break down barriers because people have seen it. Even if they maybe didn't see it in their office, in their brain, they can say, well, I've seen that happen. You know, I think female doctors are definitely no longer an anomaly. But I would also say that seeing so many women in medical fields in entertainment has played a role in that because people accept that. So I want to see entertainment, books, movies, TV shows have equal footing for everybody and that women are playing these various roles. So it was fun for me in that sense to have a series of female voices in the story. It's not the driver. It's not a in-your-face element at all, but it's, it's what I know as being a woman that was in a tech industry that's comfortable for me to build the scenario. I mean, you were the CEO of, of, a, of a tech company. And as you probably looked around, you probably didn't see at that time very many other women that were in that position. And it's still probably underrepresented to today. Yeah, it is. If you look at STEM careers in total, when they group all STEM together, women are making great strides in closing that gap. However, when you take out computer science and just look at that, women are still far underrepresented. And that's a problem because AI sits real. I mean, it is right there. It's mathematics, it's computer science. And in that follow on to your comment of we got to get it right now, we need those diverse voices right now in the AI fields and all of the different industry elements that touch AI development, the users as well as the developers, because it is really important. It will be ubiquitous in our lives and we got to get it right. For sure. Well said. As I think about the technology and having more people involved, like how do you see then just the future of work changing just on a, on a more human, human scale as the technologies and AI and everything gets smarter and smarter and better and better. What's the future of work going to be, you think, in the next five to 10, 15 years for anybody entering the market? I think that having a, an understanding of where does technology play in whatever industry you are in, you can't have a us versus them kind of concept going forward in, in the world. It's not, well, there's technology and then there's the rest of us. It's woven in everywhere. And so the comfort level needs to be there. There's definitely opportunity. People thought that, you know, spreadsheets like Excel and Lotus 1, 2, 3 were going to put accountants out of, out of work. That did not happen. 
we just do more with each one of them. So yes, there will be jobs that will be eliminated or changed, but it doesn't mean that it will crash the workforce in total. Right. Sure. Ross, you have a, a, the, the, same, the same thinking on that? Yeah, I think that, you know, technology has, you know, changed the workplace and new jobs that didn't exist, you know, five years ago are popping up all over the place. Cryptocurrency, blockchain developers, you know, if you go back five, 10 years, there wasn't so, any such jobs. And uh, so, yeah, the, the key is to, with technology, is to not leave everyone, you know, leave a huge portion of the population behind. And I think that has happened. You know, I think that it would be much better if we had universal access to the internet, you know, for everyone, so, um, especially in rural areas. And I think people like Elon Musk and Starlink is is changing that so that, you know, there will be ubiquitous, you know, access to the internet. The thing that I find interesting, I don't think people really predicted that the internet would have some of the harmful effects it's had on, you know, just what is a fact and what is what is real. And my concern is with artificial intelligence, especially as it get, becomes conversational, is that I think everyone knows, and you know, most people that really looked at how like Google works is that if you have a, a preset conceived notion of how the world works, and, and I'm going to give an example of something that GPT-3, for instance, I've built a chat port around GPT-3 called Elliebot, and most and I decided we wanted a chat bot that represented the character in the book. How cool would it be if people could chat with a character um, in the book and kind of get to know her and ask her questions? And so I built this chatbot um, based on GPT-3, and I'm sure the people that listen to your podcast, you know, understand the power of GPT-3. But one day I enjoyed my testing, and you probably see on my, on my shoulder here pictures of people walking on the moon with the Apollo missions, which had a huge influence on me. I had to ask her questions, you know, trivia type questions to see if she's working. And so I asked her about the Apollo missions and she was answering those very impressively. You could ask compound questions and she would know, you know, who the command module pilot was for Apollo 12 and she was the third man to walk on the moon. She got it all perfect. And then one time I just must have asked the question in a different way. And, and she came back and said, no, we didn't go to the moon. I'm like, Really? Um, have you been to the NASA website? And she said, I, I, I don't trust the NASA website. It's like, you know, she, I, she said, I don't trust any, you shouldn't trust any, every website you go to. I started to basically, you know, almost kind of panicking. Like, how, how is this possible? And of course, it dawned on me before we, you know, most people had ever heard of the concept of fake news. As a, as a polo enthusiast, I had always been fascinated with the statistics that said that a quarter of Americans don't think we ever went to the moon. And of course, if you go back over the last 20 years, plus of the internet being around and the World Wide Web, there's a lot of people discussing that the, you know, conspiracy theories, basically, and that was one of the biggest conspiracy theories going, you know, if you go back like 10 years ago, that was one of the most popular ones. And so GPT-3 has grabbed all of this training data from, you know, it's enormous amount of training data it grabbed and it grabs a lot of that. And so if you ask it a question in just the right way, it will dive into that pool of, of nonsense. And so my, my real concern is, is that, you know, we've got to make sure that generalized or even conversational AIs, which I think is a big part of our future, quite honestly, I think we're all, like we all got cell phones in our pockets, We'll all have conversational AIs that help us during our, our day. We've got to make sure that they're not trained on nonsense because that could be very harmful. Wow. That was an interesting discovery. It's like bad data in, then bad, bad data out. And, and even something as simple as a news feed on my Google news feed, it feels like it just continued to drive you into a certain direction. It just continues to reinforce the things that you like, then you end up in your own little bubble and you don't yes. have no visibility of what's going on outside of you, which I think is harmful. Yeah, especially with the, 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 end, the ending of kind of journalism as we, you know, as we know it, um, being ubiquitous, uh, everyone consuming journalism, certainly 30 years ago, everyone in America was consuming journalism for their news. And so there was a checks and balances in that. And, and now those checks and balances are gone. So, so yeah, it's, it's very challenging for technologists to try and get this right, I think. And so I think Moral Code, the book, really tries hard to imagine how that problem will be solved. 
on my wish list of what I wish people were developing out there is a tracking of the providence of data or decision making or you know what's come out very strong lately with art and video, et cetera, and really lock down the providence of who created it, who has edited it, and, you know, marry that with that kind of blockchain security so that it's discoverable without forensics to say this was AI created by this, or these are images that were from this, this, and this, and have been modified through these things. And that if you don't have that providence, it's like trying to buy classical art or, you know, collectible art. If you don't have the providence, it's not worth as much. So if your videos or art or decision-making or news facts, I don't want news facts to become an oxymoron. I want them to be discernible. My AI kind of wish list out there is how can we get this trackable facts and who's sharing what and who uncovered it? And where did it come from? An accurate bibliography of how do we know this is real? Yeah, like audit trail for, for what's, you know, information, if you will. And creativity. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you write something, you should cite your references. And it feels like right now that AI is just a black box to people. They throw something in and whatever the thing that comes out is then assumed to be, to be true. And I think I'm 100% behind you. We, should un- we need to understand how these systems work internally. And kind of the things that I've been seeing people say is, is just, you know, we, we need to have understandable AI, right? We need to understand in terms of you know, what's going on. When you have GPT-3 with essentially billions and billions of basically, you know, nodes in the neural network that have been, that have been trained for years, that is the most complex system we've ever seen. So it's difficult for us to explain what's going on inside there. But unless we do, it's really tough to know can we trust what's coming out of it, right? Another question I like to ask people is sort of like, so what, what is the day, a day in the life for you two? I mean, you've been successful in your careers. Now you're, uh, you know, Lois, you're, you're writing books and, and Ross, I think you're still developing technology, you know, as well. But yeah, what's, what does a typical day look like? I have a tough time saying anything's typical. You know, typical, I try to get my exercise in, but writing and research right now with the launch of the book, doing a lot of work to try and understand where, you know, where people perceive it and who, who would like to consume it. Working on another book that's not a sequel to this one. We have our ideas for a sequel, but I'm, okay. I'm working on another book as well. Just in, enjoying the days. Great. And I'm, I'm excited that Formula One's going to be here soon in the States. We'll get to go down to Austin for Formula One. So that's my typical weekend during the season is I watch my Formula One. That's good. That's good. Well, you mentioned about writing a book. I mean, it, it took you many years to write this one. Is that, is that true? Yeah, it was about four years from our original conversation to publication. You think this next one's going to take as long? No, I don't think so. Part of the time lapse was going up that learning curve of the craft of writing a novel. It was a lot of rewrites, just because I didn't know what I was doing, (laughs) I got started. And then part of it was, um, you know, COVID distractions and such. But I don't think the next one will take me as long. Okay, okay. But we'll Well, see. What about you, Ross? My my day typically starts off with exercising. I I like to play racket sports. So I play squash, which is a game like racquetball, and and now pickleball. And also now the weather is cool in Oscar in Texas. I like to go mountain biking. I'll take Lois to the to the lake and she'll kayak and I'll while she's kayaking I'm mountain biking. We're fortunate we um, have good trails and a nice lake we can live about ten minutes from. So we'll do that in the morning. I'll do that in the morning anyway. And and then I'd probably, you know, after lunch, I typically work from, you know, after lunch all the way through to like eight PM. I'm working on a robotic startup right now, which is in stealth mode. It's using AI, but nothing as impressive as in the book Moral Code. But 
working on a robotic startup with my brother. And I'm also on the board of another ro- robotic startup. I spend my time kind of working on those. That I'm developing my own technology and I'm doing the software side. My brother's doing the hardware side. And that's basically it. That it really. We, um, last night, kind of, we do our own thing, but we're always in the same building and we do you know, meals together and um, vacations together. And you know, it's just a continual collaboration. That's good. That's good. Well, as I mentioned at the beginning, you know, I really have a lot of respect for people that want to give back, you know, help startups, help the next generation of of people. And when we publish this, we'll have liner notes. So I'll have links off to the book and links to your LinkedIn profiles and stuff like that. Like what's the best way for people to reach out to you? Well, we each have our our own websites that are our names, loismelbourne.com and and rossmelbourne.com. And then we have the book site itself is moralcodethebook.com. Hopefully one day there'll be a site called moralcodethemovie.com. That's a, a goal. And then I'm on, for the readers out there, I'm on Goodreads, just as Lois Melbourne, and Twitter as at Lois Melbourne. Perfect. Are there any other topics or things that maybe you wanted to share that we didn't really discuss here today? Well, there was one, which is all of the proceeds from Moral Code we are donating. And the heart of the book is helping kids. And the challenges that they're facing is the child abuse and trafficking. So we're donating all of the proceeds for the book to the prevention of those evils. So we're starting with preventchildabuse.org which is a 50-year-old company or organization working towards that end all over the the country. And then a new organization called Thorn, like a thorn in your side. And they are a technology company that is building tech to help prevent trafficking, specifically child trafficking and identifying kids that may be in danger and perpetrators, and then helping organizations that need that data use the tech. So those are the two organizations that we're donating our proceeds to. It's fabulous. So yeah, I just took a look at, it's just thorn.org. Looks like an amazing group. Yeah, it's, it's, great, it's great to see technology being used, obviously f- for good. I feel like technology can be used in multiple different ways. And so for you to sort of you know, s- support the proceeds and kind of bring it back into the community. That's fabulous. That's fabulous. Thank you so much for being on the program today. I really appreciate the time. Really appreciate you sharing your your wisdom here, uh, your perspective here. Obviously, you did have been doing a lot of research and stuff in this space for a number of years to come up with this with this book that I know everyone will enjoy and and has enjoyed. And I think you know the most coolest part of it is just the discussion that I think it's prompting. You know, the, when I had sort of read about you know, you wanting to get this involved with basically book groups and having this conversation around ethics and AI. That's a, that's an area where I think it's not covered enough that, you know, people are so busy to jump into new technology and myself, I, I'm probably as guilty of it as just about anybody else is. I see the new shiny thing and I want to go ahead and start using it in all sorts of different ways without actually thinking about maybe how I'm not helping to solve the overall big picture of the problem. So I appreciate you spending the time writing the book. You guys seem like a, a, a great dynamic duo. It's it's like, you know, you both bring something excellent to the table. And so look forward to seeing what the next project is in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, the conversation. It's been fun. You've listened to another episode of The Conversations on Applied AI Podcast. We hope you are eager to learn more about applying artificial intelligence and deep learning within your organization. You can visit us at AppliedAI.mn to keep up to date on our events and connect with our amazing community. Please don't hesitate to reach out to Justin at AppliedAI.mn if you are interested in participating in a future episode. Thank you for listening.